Good afternoon. We're going to get moving with the next panel. Please take your seats. This panel is a mix of commercial real estate development and uh, will uh, be followed by one dedicated to residential development. I have a terrific panel that's joined us this afternoon. Uh, starting on my far left, Avra Jain is the chairman and founder of the Vagabond Group. Uh, Avra has some roots in uh, New York investment banking, but she uh, reminds me very much of someone who was on our board uh, who we miss very much, uh, really a developer in the mold of a Tony Goldman, I would say. And um, she'll be speaking to us about uh, her work in the Miami Modern District, the MIMO Historic District, along Biscayne Boulevard, as well as other areas in the city, um, including some recently announced work that I think you'll find interesting. Second, next to Abra, is Jody McLean. Jody is with Edens. She is the President and Chief Investment Officer. Uh, I got to know Jody a couple of years ago when I was invited to speak at one of their retreats and was really impressed with uh, the direction that she was taking Edens in. Edens is, uh, as I'm sure most of you know, a major retail real estate company um, with assets of $4 billion. Jody's been responsible for Eden's strategy to move the portfolio to major urban centers and create a portfolio of assets that are the center of community life. It's a real emphasis on uh, forging stronger connectivity between the retail centers and the communities which she'll speak to. And then to my immediate left, Vincent Signorella with the Florida East Coast Industries, FECI, well known uh, in uh, throughout Florida and especially South Florida. Uh, Vince has, is the president and CEO of FECI uh, with units including Flagler in commercial real estate, All Aboard Florida, Florida Global Logistics, Flagler Global Logistics, and the Parallel Infrastructure Division. Um, so we have a wide range of commercial real estate uh, perspectives on the panel. And part of my orientation for the group, uh, and you kind of you read the um, the title of the panel to think differently: innovation, entrepreneurship, and leadership in commercial real estate. Um, and I think these three really embody that title. But part of what I um, set up for them was to think about their businesses in terms of what was evolutionary at this stage in their work, uh, how the businesses are evolving, especially in the post-recession uh, environment and the revival of uh, the Miami metro area, as well as many other markets where they're active. And then also think about what about their business might be more revolutionary, what, they're really, uh, what is really changing and evolving and, and quite different from what they did before. Um, this will be um, a panel discussion, uh, and I want to invite uh, each of them to make some remarks about that um, framework, and then we'll take up some discussion after that. So I'm going to start uh, with Vincent. Uh, are, where's our AV person? Our microphones need to be turned on. <laughs> Whatever, I'll start up here. Well, okay. you want my on now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, Chuck. Um, so, Florida East Coast Industries. We are. Um, I think a bunch of you in the room understand the business a little bit. Uh, we're fortunate to be playing, as a company, we're fortunate to play with assets that were assembled over a century ago. Uh, the company was founded by Henry Flagler in the late 1800s, and, um, and most of what we do really revolves around, you know, everything that he put in the toy box, you know, back then, and then things that have happened along the way. And so underneath FECI, we have, we have four distinct businesses, um, Chuck mentioned them, um, revolutionary is a strong word, so I'll, I'd like to stick with most of these are really evolutionary. Some actually don't evolve at all. But, um, uh, you know, starting with um, for each of the four briefly, we've got, a, we've got a commercial real estate company called Flagler. 
Um, really nothing evolutionary or revolu revolutionary about that, uh, that business. We own about seven million square feet uh, of commercial real estate throughout the state. And that business is a regular way, you know, build it, stabilize it, and then figure out when our investment time frame ends and somebody else's investment time frame begins. So we're an active owner, manager, and, and ultimately seller of assets in the state of Florida. And so that's, that's pretty straightforward. Um, we've got really two new businesses that are offshoots of what had traditionally been our core business. Um, one is the business that Chuck referred to as Flagler Global Logistics. Uh, we're fortunate enough to own really more industrial entitlements in South Florida than any other company. And that's just a function of the land that was collected over a long period of time. And as a result of that, we're a very large developer of industrial real estate. Um, and, um, and so last year we built just over a million square feet here in South Florida. This year the target is about two million square feet um, throughout the state. Um, but about a year and a half ago, we evaluated that business in, in trying to understand the tangents and other businesses that we could actually get into. And, uh, and, and so forever we had been building and then leasing to the various logistics companies that operated here in South Florida. Lo you know, logistics, the port, the airport are really you know, two of the primary engines that drive the economy here. And, uh, and we came to the determination that with some of the land that we owned, and its critical connectivity to the, to the ports and to the airports that we should actually get into the logistics business. And so an evolution for us is to actually um, not end our job at building the buildings and then leasing them, but we're actually now constructing the buildings and we've formed a, a, a pretty substantial logistics company that's now operating within the confines of those buildings. And so, um, and in doing so, what, actually what we're very focused on is the, the perishables of the food market. Um, there's a, there's a, you know, a, a, a well-established trade from Latin America um, here into South Florida for lots of perishables, things that are actually grown in, in Central and South America. And, um, and so in doing so, and, and the math was actually pretty simple. So we could, as real estate developers, you know, today take, for instance, a, a building leases at six dollars net plus or minus depending on where you are when we overlay the logistics business into one of our buildings i can actually take that six dollar net result and get it to anywhere between 40 and 50 dollars just by operating inside of the business with actually very little commitment of capital and so we've taken what what most logistics companies um do is that you know they have a very asset light model we're actually the exact opposite we have an asset heavy model so the way I look at it is that we have a, our backstop is a traditional commercial real estate play and the upside is many multiples of that. And so we've actually, we've extended that business locally, but we're actually also taking that business into Latin America. And so as opposed to waiting for that product to get loaded onto an airplane or onto a ship to arrive at one of our ports or at our airport, and then jockeying for that stuff to come to our buildings, we're actually now dealing directly with the growers in countries like Chile and in Peru and in Colombia and are actually getting ready to break ground on our first building in Latin America. And so I won't let you know where that is because I don't want a bunch of people running out and developing Latin America, but, the, um, but it's where lots of stuff is grown and it's exported here. So, so we're actually out, we're acquiring land in Latin America. We're going to build buildings in Latin America, deal directly with the growers there so that we can actually control our own destiny with respect to the real estate that we own here in South Florida. So that's a bit evolutionary for us. It's, a, it's also a bit of a science experiment. So we'll let you, you know, everyone will see real time how that works out, but we think it's gonna be a great, a great result. Um, our third business is parallel infrastructure, pretty straight up business, which is a, it's a right of way management business, which means we manage rights of ways. Rights of ways are things like roads and railways, et cetera. And so we've always had that business because we control a right of way from Miami to Jacksonville. And so that's like what we own is really a 350 mile, 350 mile uninterrupted road that connects those two cities. And anytime somebody wants to cross that road, whether above it, on the surface or below it, with a pipe, a wire, a fiber optic cable, it doesn't matter what it is, they actually pay us. So it's the business that you would want your parents to leave you because you could just you know, live on an island and just get a big mailbox and collect checks. So that was an unbelievable business for us. But the next evolution of that business for us was to actually take the expertise that we had developed in managing our own right of way and, then, and, and, and look for other rights of ways throughout the country that we could actually commit capital to. 
So for instance, when you look at major municipalities, most of them, most, do a very poor job at managing their rights of ways with respect to maximizing revenue, and almost none of them commit capital to their own rights of ways. And so when I say committing capital, I mean building telecommunications infrastructure or building pipeline infrastructure in their rights of ways. And so now what we're doing is we're actually going out and pitching um, across the country to all the major departments of transportation that we will go and take the burden of management of your right of way and we'll actually commit capital to build telecommunications infrastructure, et cetera. So we actually, um, from a standing start about a year and a half ago, um, we've actually picked up, picked up now about 5,000 miles of rights of way throughout the United States. We think the opportunity set is something closer to a million, so that means we've really not even started. Um, and we're actively now developing assets in other people's rights of ways. And so I think this year we'll commit on the order of magnitude of probably about 40 or 50 million dollars on other people's rights of ways. And we're getting ready to sign our first major commitment with the major metro area, which would be New York City. Um, and so that's really the ultimate goal, is to go to a place like New York or Washington and say, hey, listen, we can go and build infrastructure for you. It doesn't cost you any money, um, and we'll share part of the revenue stream with you after we've committed the capital. And so that's been an interesting um, work in progress, and we're building out an, a, an entire team to do that. Um, I think the, you know, our final business is probably one that would err more towards the side of revolutionary, which is really which is the All Aboard Florida project that we're working on. And, um, and that's actually the, 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 the redevelopment of existing infrastructure to, to reinstate passenger service in the state of Florida. We're starting with the state of Florida because we actually own the assets. So we own, we own a, a rail corridor that, that goes to Jacksonville. Um, but what this service will do, this service actually two businesses that hold hands with each other. Um, one part of it is a transit-oriented development business, which is the development of all the commercial real estate around these nodes, these transportation nodes. Um, that we are developing. The other is a, tr a traditional, not a traditional, but an intercity passenger rail system that will connect Miami with Orlando. And so, um, you know, we are, we are, we Floridians, we are now the third largest state in the United States. We have some of the worst infrastructure and some of the most conge congested infrastructure in the United States. And so as we legged into the process, which is now about two and a half years ago, um, and, and dug into the ridership numbers, what we determined was that there's actually a half a billion people that are moving between Miami, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach, and Orlando. That's a lot of people by, any, by anybody's definition. Um, and then when, when we further qualified that group of people, we determined that there are actually about 50 million people that we think would, would get on our train. And, um, and so the good news for us was that we need a very, very, very small percentage of that for a standalone intercity rail system to actually be quite profitable. Um, but it's a unique project. Like we, we can't, we would be the first private company in the United States um, in a really long time, like when Henry Flagler built the railroad, to actually own an intercity rail system. And, um, but we, we, start with a, we started with a great head start, which is that we owned 200 of the 235 miles of infrastructure. And we needed to really just hem together the right of way that would connect us from Cocoa Beach, which is about 200 miles north of here, to the Orlando airport. And so, um, so last September, we actually completed the negotiations with the Florida Department of Transportation, um, with the, or, uh, the Orlando Orange County Expressway Authority and uh, the Greater Orlando Aviation Authority, which is the entity that manages the airport in Orlando, and now have full agreements fully executed that allow us to get from Miami all the way to Orlando. And, um, in advance of that, we actually received full environmental approvals to build the system from Miami to West Palm Beach, and we're about three quarters of the way through getting the full environmental approvals that will take us from West Palm to Orlando. And so um, another big, big science experiment, like big, it's going to be uh, about $2.3 billion to build the rail infrastructure and the, um, and, the, and, and the rolling stock and all the land that we've assembled. And there are many people who are sitting in this room who have actually helped us do a lot of the things. Um, that, that got us to this point, but, um, but it will be the first in the nation, and we hope that it would be the only, the, only the first project that we work on. We've got, you know, we've got our eyes, you know, set on other projects throughout the United States, on other people's rights of ways, um, in order to establish rail as a, as a, as a more prominent way for people to move between major metro areas. So, um, so we're, we're, you know, quite optimistic about what we've done to date, and then when we're going to break ground this year. So, um, 
So it's a very interesting project. I think that, um, Mayan, I think that qualifies as a revolutionary aspect of, uh, of the business. And um, I think it's also fascinating how it's come full circle, really, from the original roots of, of the Flagler company to FECI's All Aboard Florida initiative, you know, back to the, back to the rail route. So it's, uh, that's really uh, the, the revolutionary part for today. Jody, tell us about what's going on with Edens sure. and um, where you're taking the company in, in recent years. All right. Um, I think that I, I don't need to tell anybody in this room that in the U.S. today, we are over retail. We have 46 square feet per capita of brick and mortar space, and we have over 30 million retail outlets that are available to any single one of us 24 7. So Edens is operating, we're a 68-year-old company, and we're operating at a time um, when our industry has never been more consistently disrupted. Every day we wake up and there is somebody, something that is um, disrupting what we do each and every day. And I would tell you, though, that at this point in time, I don't think there's more evolution going on in the brick and mortar space. Some of it pure by necessity, and some of it purely because the more and more we're all disrupted with technology, the more and more we crave this human interaction. And so I think that's been the most evolutionary thing for Eaton's. Um, we've completely shifted our mindset. Um, we're a $4 billion portfolio, about 15% of which sits here in Miami. Um, the rest sits primarily in Boston, New York, D.C., Charlotte, and Atlanta. Um, and we've never spent more time focused on the science of humanity. In 2010, a survey came out by Brigham Young University that studied about 350,000 people. And it said that lack of routine social interaction with your neighbors, your colleagues, your family, <clears throat> was more harmful to people's health. That lack of routine interaction was more harmful to your health than smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, alcoholism, or obesity. And so that really made us rethink what our whole business model was. We were so busy going after wallet share and sales that we missed what was most basic in what we're doing. So we've completely evolved as a company, shifted everything we're doing to really be focused on time. We're going after people's time. We're hoping to inspire the communities around us to make three and a half trips, whether those are um, routine trips, whether you're a visitor to our community, whether you're a permanent member of our community, three and a half trips per week, and spend five hours per week with us. Our role as a landlord is no longer good enough just to lease space. Um, landlords who are in the retail space that are happy to lease and just walk away um, are finding that their sales are just being attacked from every single angle. We're having to work more and more um, in building communities not only in our physical space but in the digital space. So social media is a huge part of everything we're doing in bringing people together um, before they ever approach our centers. We have to be in constant contact with the consumer in a way that the landlord never played that role before. Um, so we're investing in technology, we're looking at technology, we're understanding technology, where that plays, because we can't really distinguish anymore where the sales are happening. If they're happening in our brick and mortar space, are they happening online? Um, and the truth is that it doesn't really matter. The human connection that's made in our places and, and at the store level is really what's driving the consumer loyalty. But where those um, sales happen, they're happening in a whole variety of places and we have to be comfortable with that. So it's forcing us to look at our leases differently, it's forcing us to look at our relationship with our retailers differently, and it's forcing us to be more engaged than we ever have been um, directly with the consumer. So I think all of that is evolving, it's continuing to evolve. Um, our focus on time, the events that we're having to plan at our spaces, um, 
what's most evolutionary right now also is probably 15 to 18 percent of all of our space is now um, driven by restaurants, um, unique restaurants and food, and by local and unique retailers. So um, just having the national retailers, um, international retailers, whether you're um, a tourist here in Miami, which drives a lot of our thought process here in Miami, or if you're in a very stabilized market, um, that unique um, experience that is um, unique and experiential in our space. This is all new over the last five years for us in the retail space. Um, and I would say the only thing that feels revolutionary that we're really on the forefront of right now is how we're really looking at the engagement in the community itself. How are we engaged with our community um, we are introducing something at Eden's called social accountancy. So we've always had financial metric at our property level, at our corporate level, operational level. We're now having to understand um, at the social level that impact that we're making in um, our communities, which is radically different than how we've had to think about things before. And so what do we mean by that? We mean that when we're um, redeveloping our centers, we spend a lot of um, our growth capital in development and redevelopment, as well as acquisitions. But as we look at our developments, what is the impact in the um, education base? What's the impact in the employment base around us? What's the impact in the crime rates around us? all of which we're finding that retail and the presence of retail and bringing community together three and a half times, forcing those human interactions and being a part of those relationships is having this huge impact um, in a really positive way in communities. So I think you're going to see more and more um, retail owners, developers really talk about their social accountancy, what's happening in communities as a result of that. Um, we have trends, we don't have enough data yet, but we will over the next couple of years to really understand what the impact of is of retail in communities. It's not going away, it's just a totally different shift in our focus of what we're doing. And um, if I could follow up on that. Um, the, when you say your communities and your understanding of your communities, how are you defining that? How are you defining, in, either in terms of neighborhoods and places or in terms of demographics and people? So we're defining our communities really, and it's radically different. So we have 100 projects, and every single project is defined differently. Um, usually it's a 15 minute travel time. So whether that's um, walkable time when we're in urban, environment, whether that's coming on mass transit or whether that's drive time. But typically, um, our projects will have 100,000 people, either permanent or um, tourism, within a 15-minute drive time. And so that's who we usually define as our community. Our communities look radically different in every place we go. Household incomes are different, interests are different, age groups are different. Um, and we have to make sure we're a reflection of every one of those. And I know, um, and we can follow up on this later, but um, you also, just a couple of years ago, hired someone dedicated to social media in a, at an executive level, which I think is another dimension to, uh, to the business that is new. We, we, we have had to hire, we did two things. We brought somebody in who had a specialty in consumer products, um, who built out a social media group that has now um, 10 people throughout our company totally dedicated to the day-to-day -day interaction with that community. So building a lot of community online that translates to driving more time at our places and larger connections. Um, we also hired Jose Andres' executive chef from the Think Food Group. He came down here and opened at the SLS um, and we hired him full-time to help run our culinary strategy because those things have made such a huge difference in building community and those routine interactions, things we would have never even considered five, seven years ago. Um, Avra, 
how did you find yourself at the Vagabond Motel? <laughs> I, I, trust me, it was not for um, <laughs> unsolicited uh, activities. Um, <laughs> It's, a, it's an evolution, <laughs> yeah. You have to be a local to appreciate that. Um, but the, um, by the way, first of all, I, I really enjoyed the first panel discussion because I'm in that space. The Vagabond Motel is in that space where um, it is walkability, it is urban infill. We don't fit in a box. We do have uh, financing you know, challenges. Um, I will say that I have had some success with local lenders. The community banks have been willing to uh, step up, and that's mostly based on track record, and have been um, giving us financing, never seed money, but financing. But one of the challenges, I think, in, in being in that space and to the, to the first panel is, the issues are with the regulators, with the banks. So even if you can get past some of the challenges with the institutional investors, how do you get the regulators to uh, support the banks a little differently? But with the Vagabond, it all starts, and this is part of the evolutionary part. Um, I like to be part of change. The real estate is always changing. That's a good thing, because when there's change, that, allow, that creates opportunities. So my reputation and what I do and what my focus is, is trying to identify new neighborhoods. And um, the Vagabond is, is, is being one of them. Um, but we've done this in Miami. I, I did it in New York and now in Miami. We've done it um, in Wynwood, uh, in the Design District Midtown area. And then we were involved in um, Little River and lastly, Biscayne Boulevard. And when people ask me, well, how do you become part of change? Um, how do you identify change um, or the evolution patterns in real estate? Um, it's very easy. You just ask. So when the design district was happening and I knew that the retailers needed a new home, I went and asked them, where would you like to be next? Or in Wynwood, the rents are going higher. You go to the gallerist, you go to the, to the tech company startups there and you ask them, where would you like to be next? And you take that information, you listen, and then you go try to find them, be slightly ahead of the curve, be part of the evolution, be part of the change, and then make that investment. Which is, that's the challenging part really, is having the courage to take the information, um, having the intuition, and, um, and as a trader, having been a trader on Wall Street, being, being willing to, to pull the trigger and commit. So that's, you know, sort of what our, my philosophy has been. The Vagabond being right now probably the most, you know, talked about in the, in the city and probably the most impactful. Because when you are part of change, you know, what part of change? So you're, you're changing how people move, you change how people shop. I, I'm changing, um, I'd like to think I change, I'm changing sort of making lifestyle, you know, just, you know, helping in that category, in the lifestyle category. And um, in, in neighborhoods, how to build neighborhoods. And earlier they talked about walkability and all that. I can tell you that, that works. Walkability, I would tell you in Miami, drivability, parkability is becoming a big issue. And so, um, you know, that space is very successful. That's the space I've really always been in. It's just to what degree. The Vagabond came about because I had a friend that came to town. Again, part of change. They, didn't, they no longer wanted to stay on the beach. They wanted to stay on the Miami side. They wanted to go to the galleries that were there, the restaurants were there. And I suggested that they go and stay at the New Yorker Motel up the block. Well, they went to try to stay at the New Yorker Motel, and it was full at $125 a night. I go, well, that's interesting. There's another hotel down the block called the Bianca, also, you know, another urban um, sort of renewal rehab project. They got the last room for $100 a night. So I was listening. So I drove up to Biscayne Boulevard, and I saw this fabulous piece of property, abandoned and boarded up, and 
it's been sitting there, and people will tell you they've been driving to buy it for, for you know, several years now. And, but I decided that I would take the leap of faith, and I bought the motel. So the Vagabond now, we, are, um, we bought it about, uh, about six, 14 months ago. We started construction about six months ago, and we will be opening April 1st. Um, one of the things when you talk about evolution, one of the things that I realized in the process of being a developer was more than just, you know, we all talk about the buy, being able to buy right. That's the first thing. The second thing where we have risk, like how do we reduce our risk as developers, is then on the execution side. So one of the things that's happened for me over time is I've gotten much, much more involved on the construction side of the, of the business. In fact, most people would recognize me more in a pair of jeans and, and work boots because I spend a lot of time on the job site and I spend a lot of time on the execution because that's where, you know, that's where you end up, you make the money on the buy and you, and you, and you give it back on the execution. So I've worked very hard over time. I've evolved into becoming much more of an executor. I've brought in um, in-house GC, I have a group of subs that I work with on a regular basis, and um, I'm always involved in trying to find new products and, um, you know, and new ideas and sustainability and so forth. So that's been an evolution for, for me. Um, and you know, what I would, I would say to people coming to Miami, and there's a lot of interest right now in Miami, is you have to spend a lot of time, what we call boots on the ground. And again, to be part of evolution, to, um, to be you yourself to evolve and, and come up with new ideas and new opinions, you need to be at the front lines. So um, that's something I've always done. It's something that I would always encourage everybody to do. So when you come to Miami and you're looking to make investments here, or expand your investment ideas, just walk. Walk, walk into the local restaurants, walk into the local bars, talk to people, see what they're doing, see what they're thinking, and recognizing that things are changing and identifying the opportunities to be a part of that change. Um, so that's kind of where I am. I mean, obviously, Biscayne Boulevard is, is right now. Um, kind of a, you know, sort of a front, we're really, I don't know, are we a town or a city? I, I don't know. I think, I think we're a, a big town. But in this um, city, you know, Biscayne Boulevard is a very good story. It's um, one of the oldest neighborhoods in Miami. It had um, fallen to disrepair over the last uh, about 15 years when the focus shifted to the beach. So here's something where things go kind of full circle. So they had these beautiful 1950 motels that um, had slowly become taken over by drugs and prostitution and all these sorts of things. And um, even though the neighborhoods behind it were changing, Bell Mead, Morningside, changing very fast very, and, and expensive um, you know, neighborhoods with affluent um, homeowners, um, the change hadn't occurred one block away. And, and so there was this sort of disconnect between these wealthy, wealthier neighborhoods and a boulevard that had become sort of um, in derelict, for, for a better word. And so, again, recognizing that there's an evolution to neighborhoods, we made a pretty significant investment in the idea that Biscayne Boulevard was really uh, a gem that needed to be uh, renovated and um, restored. So we've bought eight properties on Biscayne Boulevard, five of them being the, the, the motels. Again, part of change. We recognize that the motels were the issues because the motels are where the, the, the businesses that were going on there that were taking down the neighborhood. It was the, you know, the drugs and the, and, you know, I loved it. I, the last motel I bought, the sign that I walked in said, after five minutes, no refund. I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's, and so, I mean, 
yeah, that's. I'll be quick. <laughs> yeah, I saved that sign, by the way. It's a reminder. But but recognizing that in in order to change that neighborhood, you had to change the motels. You had to take that business away. So when we made a commitment to Biscayne Boulevard, we focused on the motels, and we knew that if we took changed the motels. We took that business element, that style of that business, whatever, away. Then we, other things would happen, and they did. Um, just since we bought, other investors have come in, new restaurants, and a, a big movement of people from the beach, other hotel people from the beach, looking, Quattro, um, the Conkle Group, big names, um, Ugo Fresh. Now all of these people have all bought properties. Within five blocks of the Vagabond Motel, um, so you know, and when we look at change too, you need to sometimes acquire enough properties to have an impact. You know, you guys create, you know, destinations and and so forth. So we had to strategically buy enough properties where we felt like that, um, you know, we wouldn't be just a destination; that we were going to be developing a whole neighborhood, and. Um, right now, you know, uh, the vagabonds being, you know, sort of credited as being the tipping point for that neighborhood. Um, you know, the 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 good news is that it's a tipping point. The bad news is now the prices are much higher. So, you know, even though we've identified other properties we'd like to buy, you know, uh, it's sort of out of our discipline. Um, hopefully, um, that won't stop the growth. Sometimes, when when other property owners get so excited about the improvements. They stifle the growth because they they get very excited about the pricing. So hopefully um, things will continue on Biscayne Boulevard. Um, we're very excited to be bringing neon back to the boulevard, um, and I, we think that um, this is the next uh, the next neighborhood. As far as revolutionary, I think what was revolutionary was. Um, how I identified an, an arbitrage in real estate, which typically there is no such thing as an arbitrage in real estate. Um, there was, in, in focusing on this neighborhood where it was a historic district, uh, no, no credit to me, a credit to the people who worked so hard to establish that, I had found in, I do a lot of homework, in my doing my zoning analysis and re reviewing the ordinances and so forth, that there was an opportunity to transfer development rights from the properties. So while most people in the neighborhood were really upset about the historic aspect and the down zoning of their properties, they, um, they, I don't know if they forgot or they didn't realize they had the opportunity to take the additional air rights above a piece of property and sell them off to other developers. So it's public information. Um, so for instance, the Vagabond Motel, I paid $1.9 million for it, um, but I sold the air rights for $3.2 million. So uh, I got paid to buy real estate. So that's kind of revolutionary, I think. But what that did, that allowed me, there was obviously strings attached to that. We, we, were, we re we had to reinvest you know, the monies into the property. But that allowed us to do a much nicer, a much better project than we would have. Um, otherwise, the economics wouldn't be there. So I'm happy to say that we will, be have, we will have a, probably one of the nicest hotels in Miami on Biscayne Boulevard in a neighborhood where um, two years ago, um, you would have been very, uh, very nervous you know, walking down the block. So we're very excited to be a part of it. We think it was a privilege to have the opportunity to be a part of change. And um, so I'm all about evolution. I hope my uh, the students are listening to this because uh, it's not always just what's on the ground uh, or what's in the zoning code, but um, the, the way you were able to leverage the transfer development rights was um, crucial to, to what you were able to do there. I actually had a Saudi student, he may be here, who did an entire paper on transfer development rights, and he's bringing that concept home with him. So maybe it'll do some, uh, do some good for some work there. Um, I want to zoom out for a minute, especially on the, this retail uh, landscape perspective, because Miami is really evolving rapidly. And unlike um, you mentioned earlier, Jody, that 
um, in a lot of places in the U.S. were over-retailed. Miami has not been over-retailed. In fact, vacancy rates have been uh, pretty low. It's been, and the reason we're seeing so much uh, investment now in the in the retail landscape is is because uh, there's pretty sound fundamentals there. But it's evolving rapidly. There's many places uh, coming into being. There's um, the places mentioned earlier, Wynwood Design District. There's Brickell City Center coming on. Uh, there's um, uh, uh, the, there's the beach, there's Lincoln Road, there's Bell Harbor. Um, so within this patchwork of places evolving, I mean, part of the question, and we talked about it a little bit earlier, is how is this competition going to play out? But I think there's a, maybe there's a different aspect to the question is, do you see these places being able to evolve as their own, each coexisting as their own distinct place um, with maybe a somewhat different retail mix or identity? So I'll throw that out to that end of the panel. Um, I, I would say the um, tourism here gives Miami a whole different perspective than just about any other market we're in with the exception of New York. Um, so the $36 billion that comes in every year from tourism is huge. Um, from our perspective, one of the most exciting things going on is what's happening in downtown Miami. So for the first time, um, I think you'll see downtown Miami really evolve into, there's a lot of discussion about a walkable urban environment, but with real retail as a part of it and what's going on right now with the Miami Met, what's going on um, around the downtown to Brickell area, I think is one of the best things going on with all the office, um, but also the residential coming downtown. So I think that downtown is ready for it. Um, I think, yes, it will be independent of what's going on. Um, what's going on in the design district, personally, um, gets me very energized. We talked about this a little bit before, but I think the design of that district itself, its uniqueness there, um, will continue to grow, grow and thrive. Um, from our perspective, I think as density comes to that area, more and more density will continue to come to that area, um, that retail will continue to flourish. Um, and then I think what's going on out at the beach and in the beach area um, continues to be its own node driven both by what's happening there and so much by the tourism out there that from our perspective, um, Miami can continue to absorb. Um, there is a lot that's coming all at the same time. The new convention center, what's going to happen around the new convention center at Miami World. But I think it will, as it comes, it will continue to drive more and more activity um, as the larger convention center comes online. Um, more tourism will come that retail slowly but surely will all be absorbed. And yes, we think Miami um, from what we can see, can continue to absorb that. Um, and I would tell you from where we sit and all the markets we're working on, this is one of the best markets for retail. Bullish on Miami. Bullish retail. on Miami. We are bullish on Miami and Miami retail. Do you, do you feel vulnerable to, if the tourism was to shift, do you feel, it, yes. would that be, is that something you guys watch closely? We watch very closely yeah. and where the tourism is coming from. So it's um, not just from Latin America, from Europe, um, obviously from Canada, but we watch all those cycles. We think tourism here is a huge part of what drives um, what's happening, but a lot of our investments also are very much embedded in the permanent population. So we, we are trying to balance those investments um, because when the tourism stops, which we saw, which we all yeah. participated in, um, it is impactful, but I think the one thing we know is that it came back here a little bit quicker than it came back anywhere else. Yeah, yeah we're seeing the demand on the on the hotel side too. So Rising. it's like continuing. yeah, it's like you know continuing. when you, yeah, it's just and then and then now we're gonna have a train stop. We're gonna, we're gonna right, and, and as businesses, we need businesses and we need education. We need what you're doing here at the University of Miami to continue to attract talent. We would say the one thing that's hardest for us is to attract great talent to Miami. And Vince, this is something you and I also spoke about, um, the, the need for more talent. Um, and uh, also, I think the broader um, 
economic picture for the region um, to kind of fill in. There, there's a need for better jobs to retain some of that talent as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the one thing we all pat Miami on the back, and it's a great place. I'm not from here, so it's a little bit easy to poke fun at it. Um, but the one thing that Miami's not done a great job at is balancing the, the job base um, in that its primary focus has been on hospitality and condominium development. And so and, and, and to, to better balance that and to attract the younger generation to come and live here, you, you actually have to, and you have to attract companies to move here, right? And so, in fact, there are very few large headquarters in South Florida. And the reason they're not here is because, I mean, because when you look at the cost of education, it's very high. The public school system is not so great, but getting better. And, um, and so, as a result, there, just, there, there aren't as many jobs here. And by the way, this, you know, very much in line with the first panel, you know, urbanism, it doesn't matter what people who are 50 plus years old think, right? A, a younger generation does not want to sit on I-95 in traffic, right? They want to live close to where they work and they want to eat close to where they live and work. And there's a balance there. That's not, the whole world is not going to collapse into one giant city, right? So, but, but there is a major push for those types of things and Miami will not, the, you know, the tipping point will occur when Miami can attract technology businesses and healthcare businesses, et cetera, and those that, in, in, in student, people who are 20 to 25 years old, right? But you don't get the 25 year old that can come into downtown Miami unless you have the apartment, the 700 square foot apartment that rents for $2,000 a month, right? So if you don't, every, everything can't be, you know, you know, you know, four to $5 per foot or, you know, on a rental basis or, you know, $1,000 a foot on a sale band, like there's, there's a massive disconnect between attracting young people who, are make, who, who will make fifty, seventy-five thousand dollars dollars $75,000, but providing them places to live because they're not gonna come here and go and live in homestead, right? So, so we've gotta create an urban environment that's actually affordable, and, and so there's, that, that's gotta be a primary focus of Miami if it wants to become world class. What we're seeing, what we're seeing um, which is very interesting, it kind of reminds me of New York. I, did New York before I did Miami, is we're seeing a lot of young people who are starting up businesses. We're seeing a lot of entrepreneurship. So hopefully one day they will be the Fortune 500 companies. But we have a lot of warehouse space, and we have changed it into creative office. So we're seeing it's affordable. You know, it's the you know twelve to fifteen dollars a square foot, so they can get started. The other thing that we're seeing is a lot of people are spending time in Miami. They may have jobs somewhere else, but because of technology, they're able to work from home or work from their cell phone so that a lot of this, a second home here, um, you know, is really almost a primary home. And we're seeing that in one of our motels, I had been asked by a lot of people in, in the influent neighborhood for small office space. So the people that live in Belmead and Morningside, they want a home office, but they didn't want to be at home. So I'm actually taking one of my motels that has 20 rooms, and I'm turning them into office suites, 300 square foot office suites with a conference center and so forth. You know, we had talked about office earlier, and now office is changing. That's a minimum of 15 minutes, though, in the office, right? Not five minutes. Yeah, <laughs> 15 minutes. Yeah, and I don't know. So I think that um, you know, I've always felt there's a disconnect in Miami between the, the jobs and the income levels, and I think a lot of people are making money maybe outside of the outside of Miami, but they, they do spend a lot of time here. And I am seeing a lot of young people stay in Miami, and some of it has to do with the arts. I think we underestimate the arts um, and the influence that has, be it um, our Basel, be it the, the, the museum here. And, um, and it's, I'm glad to see Miami, uh, the University of Miami, focusing on urbanism. I think you, your, your program is very current and I think um, very relevant for Miami. Well, and I think uh, part of the answer of attracting and retaining uh, talent has to do, as you're saying, with the arts and, and amenities, and we're in, you know, a fantastic venue. Um, last night, I was uh, at the Performing Arts Center at the Knight Hall. My daughter was performing in the New World uh, 
uh, School of the Arts Symphony there. So we're, we have, we're getting these great venues as well as the you know, Art Basel and the, the more fine-grained fabric of, of that. So part of it's what to, how we attract, and part of it is the core businesses that uh, have to do with logistics. Um, international businesses is locating here, you know, bringing jobs as well. So there's it's kind of, I think, two sides, uh, the push and the pull for that. I have the green light to go to 3.05, which means I only have like three minutes, but I did want to try to uh, open it up for one, maybe a couple of quick questions. I heard there were going to be students out there with microphones. Can you hold the microphone up? I see one back on my right all the way in the back. How about another one? Is there another student up here? And if, you, if you're close, you can tell me what the question is and I'll repeat it. Just hold your hand up if you want someone. There we go, right here. Hi, I was wondering if Little Havana was on your radar at all in terms of emerging neighborhoods and next things. I bet it is. <laughs> Oh gosh, you're asking me to give away secrets. Um, yes, I think uh, Little Havana is, and it's not just on my radar, it's on a lot of people's radar, not just because it's an interesting, it's, again, it's a neighborhood, it's diverse, it you know, has some history. I think people like that stuff. I think people underestimate the value of that. But it's also Brickle West. So I think that um, there's a lot of, um, you know, I think smart, money looking there. Um, it would be great to see the community get involved in that, um, in that change. And I think the trick is to identify what, what the nucleus is there. And it'd be great if the community helped identify that nucleus and then, you know, help it grow from there. But I think there's a tremendous opportunity there. Yes. Time for one more. Raise your hand. Yes. See anyone? Tell us more about the train. What steps do you have to go through to make it happen? Yeah, the, the question to you when we were uh, meeting earlier was, uh, yeah. what's the trigger point? You said the trigger point was a long time ago. The trigger point was <laughs> $60 million ago. Um, no, that's rough order magnitude of what's been spent to date. So, um, so we, have the, we have the approvals to build from Miami to West Palm Beach. And, um, and so we are interviewing, we're in the final interviews for uh, CM for our Miami downtown station, which is really all of that surface parking that you see in downtown Miami. And so the goal, we would be selecting a CM and starting some of the infrastructure in the next 60 days. Um, and so the goal is to have service in place uh, in 2016. You know, the, the incredible advantage that we have is that 200 of the 235 miles of infrastructure is actually already in place. And so we're, for the first 200 miles, we are really just augmenting the infrastructure that freight trains have run on continuously for 100 years. And so that, my development guys, you know, when I oversimplify, they get mad at me, but really we're just, where there are two tracks, we're adding a third, we're adding an overlay of communication systems and switching, et cetera. So, um, and so you'll start to see some of that work uh, happen over the next 60 days. Um, yeah. All right, great. Um, we're going to take a short 10 minute break. Please be back in your seats about 3.15. Please give my uh, panel a round of applause.